Welcome. Welcome to Stoughton Media Access Cable and Community Forum. My name is Steve Kelly. I'm your host. And today I have the pleasure of bringing to you John Linehan, who is the president and CEO of Zoo New England. So welcome to the show, John. Thank you very much, Steve. Right. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I have to confess that deep down I'm nine years old and anything to do with zoos and animals just gets me that. pepped up. I can see that. And I understand you brought some guests as I well. I did. I brought a couple of guests uh, that, that we can pull out as you deem appropriate. But uh, I wanted I went the near and far route. So something that's found right here in Stoughton and something that comes from the other end of the world in Australia. Wow, that's going to be fun. So but before we go there, um, how long have you been working at the zoo? I've been at the zoo for 33 years. So uh, ever since I graduated from college, I went to college for wildlife management. Thought I'd work in Africa, but... Uh, that didn't pan out. I took, a, I took a, a temporary job at the zoo and uh, said, I said to the guy at the time, I'll take it while I'm looking, and then now it's 33 years later. <laughs> That's a heck of a temporary <laughs> job. <laughs> Never thought That's it the would... longest temporary job I've ever heard of. I, I, I would say it's, it's a safe bet. It's, it's tough to compete with. <laughs> so what was the first thing you did? Uh, the first thing I did when I got to the zoo when uh, that 33 years ago was uh, take care of birds, actually. Um, so I ended up uh, caring for parrots and ducks and, and incubating eggs and, and uh, just a lot of bird experience. We had, we had at the time a really large bird collection, a very diverse bird collection, and I got to learn an awful lot. I also learned how to make a lot of animal diets, which is a lot of cutting and chopping. You wouldn't believe some of the ingredients. You know, this one has a half a rat in it, and this one has, uh, you know, five pounds of, of raw meat in it, and that one's got, you get, we had to boil up eggs and fish, and uh, we have, we have a, a very expensive food bill every week. <laughs> okay, um, let me step back a little. Um, President of Zoo New England. Now that right. comprises two zoos, right? That's right. The Franklin Park Zoo, which is in Boston, right in the middle of Boston, and uh, the Stone Zoo, which is about uh, 15 miles north of the city in Stoneham, Massachusetts. It's named after a guy named Stone, but uh, Walter Stone, one of the directors, and and but it's located in Stoneham, right on, right on uh, a, a beautiful pond. So it's a picturesque location. It's within the Middlesex Fells, which are very similar to the Blue Hills. Okay, and um, <coughs> how are the two zoos uh, different, for instance? Well, that's a, that's a great question. We've, we've designed them, we've designed the collections at this stage to be very different. So Stone Zoo uh, actually has been around longer than Franklin Park Zoo and uh, hit its centennial back in 04 or 03, something like that, Franklin Park a couple of years ago. So both of them are 100 years old, but they're very different experiences. Uh, Franklin Park is, uh, a big 72 acre piece of land within a 500 acre park and Stone Zoo is only 26 acres so you know geared more toward a small family that's pushing a stroller um, and we've got a collection of animals at Stone Zoo that's primarily what we refer to as New World so North and South America as opposed to Asia and Africa and, and so we've done some Australia at each place but we have very different animals between the two zoos so at Stone Zoo, for example, our big cats, we have jaguars and cougars, uh, Canadian lynx. And down at Franklin Park, we have lions and tigers and, uh, and bears. ocelots. Lions and tigers Actually, and bears. no bears at Franklin <laughs> Park. That's, uh, we have them at Stone, uh, okay. a pair of black bears, Bubba and Smokey. <laughs> okay. Uh, they were a couple of rescues that, that were uh, uh, headed for six feet under if we didn't take them. But uh, we built a really nice exhibit, and they get along great, and they're uh, big crowd favorites because they're a couple of clowns. All right. So now if I'm watching the show, I'm thinking, well, all right, we know where they are. Uh, when are they open? Why should my family go there? Oh, easy. <coughs> they're open every day. The only days we're closed are uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving. Unless there's a really bad snowstorm, and then I don't think anybody wants to come anyways. But we have people that are there 24-7, uh, whether we're open or not. These animals need care. At mm -hmm. Franklin Park, I have uh, over 1,200 animals, and at Stone Zoo, another 600 animals. So wow. there's a lot of animals to take care of. And uh, when we have a hurricane, for example, staff has to be in there. But the zoos are open every day from 10 to 5 weekdays this time of year and 10 to 6 on weekends and holidays. And um, 
it's, it's just a blast. Um, the, the, we're in prime zoo season right now. If you want to go to the zoo, any animal facility and see active animals, yep. it's before it gets too hot. Like, you know, so when you feel vigorous, the animals feel, feel vigorous. vigorous. <laughs> I don't care if they come from Africa or they come from Alaska. Yep. They end up really honing in and, and adapting to our environment. They feel like we do, even despite their, their long histories of either you know having evolved in a hot environment or having evolved in a cold environment. So although we do baby our giraffes at Franklin Park, the zebras are out almost every day. Wow. They can be out all winter as long as it's not too icy or if it's below zero. All these animals go back into warm quarters at night. Sometimes we, we will actually leave a door open for them to come and go as they want. For example, we have Christopher, our really old man lion, and we're easy on him now. So he's got a nice heated off exhibit space, but he can come out and in an, dawn exhibit, what we've done is actually build in a heated rock that he can climb up on top of. He likes to go up there and scare away all the lions from Dorchester, all the other lions. And, <laughs> you know, he starts roaring up there, but it's a nice warm place for him to lie down. So it's, it's really great to see him up there in the snow and the snow melts off it and you see this mist rising around him and then he gets up and roars and you see the his breath coming out in the cold air, but um, this is prime zoo season right now. It's it's uh, a great time to visit the zoos, and, and uh, a lot of the schools are coming out in droves right now. Good. Um, I would like you to uh, bring out an animal, just a, a very sure. visual uh, well, thing to get the, the show off. Let's start off, off with to a this good guy. Pace. So, what do you have? This is called a blue tongued skink. A blue tongued skink. Skink? Yes. I've never heard of a blue tongue skink. I'll be honest with you. I don't have a degree in anything. Well, that's they related to that. But they actually a skink come. Skink is apparently a lizard of sorts. That's swats. correct. Wow. So this is this is a. You, know, you see his blue wow. tongue come out. I need out? my glasses. Look at that blue tongue. And oh, uh, did you see that, Leo? Can you give us a close up? Oh my goodness. Look at that tongue go out there. So they actually use that tongue sometimes to scare off a predator. Oh, I'm scared. <laughs> But, but they're, they're nice animals. Uh, again, it's an Australian animal. Comes from, uh, most of Australia is pretty arid, but also the, the sort of gardens in the suburbs and everything, they climb around and I don't know if he'll move for us. He's got five, a uh, regular five fingers? Yeah. Uh, or four fingers and a thumb. So this guy's name is me. Benny. He's about uh, Benny? nine years old, yeah. And how long do they generally? Into uh, their mid-teens, generally speaking. So he's? He's 60 years old. Yeah, you know? I'd say. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. So and he's a little nervous, I'd say. You see how he's uh, staying very still. And, and he's got this pattern on him that we call it cryptic coloration. So it's a broken pattern. It blends with leaves. If we've kind of got leaves on here. But if he was in a garden area where there were leaf litter, he would blend in very well. Wow. And they, they're omnivorous. They sort of eat fruits and vegetables and bugs and... Uh, and they can actually, you know, like you've heard of some lizards, they can actually shed their tail if a predator grabs their tail, and it keeps wiggling. Oh, my goodness. And, and it'll grow back to some extent. Right now, uh, many of these lizards, for example, have fat stores in there to help them get through the lean times when, when they can't find food. But they're, you know, it's, it's obviously what we technically call an ectotherm, a cold-blooded animal. So they take on the temperature of the environment, and they do use things like, uh, he's got sharp little claws, uh, they do use things like uh, solar radiation to warm themselves up. They'll go out on a, a flat rock, and a flat dark colored rock if it's cold out. But they are, he's got a really uh, sort of pleasant, almost smile on his face. Yeah, and he, he seems to have like a gill on the back. That's his ear. That's his ear. Yeah, so that's where he's, uh, hearing from. You, I don't know if you know, but snakes are deaf. They don't have an ear. This is going to be a great <laughs> show, i got to tell you. <laughs> they, they feel vibrations in the ground, but lizards can actually hear. hear. Wow. So he's, is uh, it okay to just kind of yeah, rub him actually, gently? Yeah, actually, you could probably even hold him. Uh, if, uh, just don't get nervous, and I'll, I'll keep a hand on him still. Hi there, fella, I think. Wow. So he's, he's a relatively benign character. Yeah, but very lovely. Yeah. Gee. You know, the thing about these guys, this guy came to us through one of the zookeeper's friends who had bought it as a pet. 
And that's the one thing I, I always like to talk about is exotic animals as pets. And, and we have a whole bunch of education uh, information available at the zoo about that on that subject. But it's a big commitment. And the zoo isn't in a position where we can take all everybody's leftover pets that they got tired of having. You know, if, if you're going to get one of these exotic animals, first of all, make sure it's legal. Second of all, make sure you actually have the resources to take care of it properly. We were just talking about uh, Winslow Farm and how many animals end up there because people haven't taken good care of them. So yeah, the Thank you, by the way. It's nice to give a shout out to <laughs> Winslow Farm down in Norton where uh, Deborah White does a nice job um, you know, taking care mm. of animals has a nice little free roam yeah. zoo area. I um, can't wait to visit. Yeah, <laughs> so we have all these um, wonderful people that, um, so what is it that attracts you to animals? What kind of personality is it that, that says, I'm gonna dedicate my life to animals? You know, it, it was something I was born with, I think. Um, grew up, I, you know, I grew up in Canton and, and was always out in the woods and, and had dogs and cats and other animals, but I, I don't know what brings it. I, I sometimes wonder because we have a lot of zookeepers that have my sort of attraction to animals and they're really committed to conservation and committed to maintaining the highest quality of life for all these animals. And sometimes I think it's people who, especially when they were young, were a little shyer and uh, animals, that's one of my theories. Uh, you know, yeah. some animal you people- You can have more than one, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> one uh, of your many, that's nice. Yeah, so, uh, I was shy when I was a little kid. Now I'm yeah. up there, you know, I have to go out and speak in On front TV, of crowds. Doing a good job. And yeah, yeah. I've, I've gotten over it. But when I was young, I loved animals. So I, don't, I don't know, maybe they were non judgmental, huh? Uh, you know, they take you at face value. So not a, a, a wonderful thought, huh? They're very, uh, the one thing I found in working at the zoo for all the years, I've had more adventures with animals, you know, uh, than you can imagine. But animals are straight shooters. They, they aren't deceptive, they aren't, uh, they don't have some of the negative attributes some humans have. And uh, we have a crew that is so dedicated to taking optimal care of them. We have some video we'll see later on, the, on our training programs, which are absolutely fascinating. And even with something like a lizard, you can actually train them. And what, what we use is called positive reinforcement uh, training. It's, it's called operant conditioning. I think my wife does that with me, actually. <laughs> I'm sure she does. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you can really enhance with, with a lot of our animals. We're enhancing their care through that training. Wow. So I don't know. Benny's, uh, you know, he's, he was one that got lucky in terms of finding a good home after somebody bought him in a pet store. But, uh, you know, it's a big commitment. That's the one thing I really want people to understand, that especially something like parrots. We, have, we get calls all the time from people that want to place parrots and big snakes with us. And we, we've already taken as many as we can take and we don't have an endless room for these animals. So we sometimes can help in placement, but um, it's a big commitment that, that you get into when you buy these animals or when you take these animals. A lot of kids that go off to college leave their parents hanging with them. Um, now, would it be appropriate to let uh, Benny, is it? Yeah. Is it, would you just sit with us in the front? Or uh, I probably he'd, he'd won't move out when I pull out the other animal that okay, I we'll, brought we'll along. We'll see if he'd like to sit down. Yeah, and let's see if he wants enjoy to the move. Show. It'd be nice to see if uh, now, let people this is see. as large as these animals get, apparently. Yeah, just about, yeah. Yeah, and he, it's, he's about 18 inches long, if you, if you can't tell on TV. But, um, and what does he feel like? Um, I mean, <laughs> well, this is going to be horrible, but he feels like leather shoes or a suitcase, so that's not good for him, <laughs> I don't think. No, he, he <laughs> um, you know, it's nice, it's like dry. It's almost a plastic uh, yeah. finish. So he's probably nervous now because I mentioned the shoes <laughs> <laughs> or a handbag. I don't know. That's not good. Um, so now talk to me a little bit about um, species survival because, oh, you know, how does this guy, uh, as docile as he is, um, how is he going to avoid predators and even humans that are taking over more and more land, et cetera? Well, these guys are a good and interesting case in that in some ways they are uh, succeeding where humans are living in Australia. Uh, they blend in nicely. People like to have them in their gardens because they help with pest control. So oh. they, they like to have them out there. And uh, they do have what I refer to as that cryptic coloration. They, they blend in with their environment. They have that blue tongue that they can use to uh, suddenly ward off a, a uh, predator that might be thinking about eating them. 
They can also uh, whip that tail around if he really gets nervous. And also, as I said, let that tail come off, which keeps moving, keeps the predator busy while he climbs off and climbs under a rock. What an amazing adaptation, though, yeah. to, to be able to shed a part of yourself so, you know, quickly enough For survival, yeah. to, to allow yourself to survive such an incident. Yeah. Um, so he's, a, he's a, an interesting example. What we do, is, uh, we, we actually have programs. Uh, the Franklin Park and Stone Zoos are both accredited by the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And through that association, we have very, very elaborate uh, management programs for each species. And depending on each species, um, different lineage and their genetic background, they, we actually generate plans where you send, we trade and swap animals constantly between the zoos in order to maintain genetic diversity. So ah. all these animals are multi, what, what I always say, a multi-generational captive born. We're not getting animals out of the wild and haven't been for a long time. They're all captive born. And very important that we maintain that genetic diversity uh, in captivity uh, in part to keep healthy captive populations and in part there are some species where we actually have to do reintroductions. Right, so, so, that, so this would help a species survive if it right. was, uh, let's it, say that the, the female uh, portion of that species was diminishing from some predator or something, then you could introduce? Well, for example, at Stone Zoo, we have what are, what are called Mexican gray wolves. It's one of the subspecies of gray wolf. They actually were wiped out in the wild and now are being reintroduced just from our captive stocks, but we've had to breed them very, very carefully to maintain that genetic diversity, their ability to adapt in that, in that environment. So uh, we've also, for example, we have uh, uh, cranes at Franklin Park called red-crowned cranes. It's a uh, very endangered crane from Russia, China, the Far East. And we've been sending eggs back from our pair along with a couple of other zoos and they get carried. It's, a, it's literally trains, planes, and automobiles and, and buggies. Yeah. yeah, we keep the, actually have, uh, you have to, because in many cases, no place to keep it plugged in. Yeah. You actually have to carry hot water bottles with you and make sure you, get, you find a place to find hot water to keep those eggs incubating. You can't let them get chilled. And now our pair of cranes has uh, like five or six offspring flying wow. free in uh, Russia, China, uh, the Koreas. Wow. So it's w w one of my keepers was there bringing more eggs back and one of the cranes returned and they pulled out the binoculars and identified its band number and they said, that's Boston. Oh. <laughs> so they named the crane Boston. We work with a, uh, some conservationists in Russia at a... Wow. Uh, uh, Russian nature preserve, and they finish hatching them, and then they mix them with the wild cranes. Now, now you obviously it's very exciting, but what's the most fun for you at the zoo? Like, what you think of the last time where you went? This is fun. Like, uh, what, what was the most? It's fun the piece? interaction with the animals. Well, I, I I should say sometimes it's the interaction with the kids. Yeah. You know, I got into this because of the animals, but I've I've gained so much personal satisfaction from the difference we make with the kids. And to see the kids get excited, see the kids get motivated. Um, you know, we work with an awful lot of urban kids, some of which have uh, very difficult backgrounds. And to see them progress and help them with a college application and, and uh, help them with their college selection. And, and then to have some of them that go on to vet school or on to get a PhD in primatology or something. Yeah. It's very rewarding. But, uh, you know, I still have never lost my love of the animals. and, and Sometimes the, the zookeepers there feel bad for me because I'm, you know, I'm out there fundraising, I'm out there uh, playing politics and, and creating collaborations with other organizations. Yeah. I don't get to do the animal stuff very often. So they sometimes call me and ask me to help out. And they, not that they really need me, but uh, <laughs> they, they I, sti I, I still do consider myself the best animal guy in the zoo. Wow. Um, you know, I've, I've had uh, more adventures with animals over the years. It's, people always say, you should write a book. Well. I, I, unfortunately, I didn't keep notes on it, but I have a lot of them I can still remember. And well, give, give us like two of your best adventures. <laughs> the thing, something that happened where you're trying to move an animal, let's say, and they have other ideas. <laughs> well, that's, that's happened. The first one that jumps into my mind is a camel. But um, I, I once had a situation where we were, we were just opening our new lion exhibit. And uh, we were, because in these new naturalized exhibits, it's not like you have the animal all caged in. 
you know, that's open topped, you have moats, you have uh, stone rock walls. You want to make sure you didn't miss anything when you put the lions out in this case. So we literally are out there with all of our equipment, you know, everything from dart guns to fire extinguishers in case a lion comes up the rock wall. We're at the top of it already and we're going to scare it back in, lock it in and make changes. Um, so I have people stationed all around the, the exhibit and I gave the word on the radio to one of my staff to let the lions out and uh, so we did that and the lions came out and they promptly went right back in. We had two sets of doors. When I say come out, out of, the, out of their off exhibit areas right. and back into the building. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, can you push them through again? And uh, we want to have them on exhibit, getting used to the exhibit. So she said, yeah, this one won't move. Uh, I handed my radio to my partner and uh, when I was way up the top of this rock work, so I had to run across the top of a wall with a 30-foot fall over here and uh, jump down onto a roof and cross it and climb down a ladder. And uh, I said, this is what I meant. Shut this door, open this door, and then when he goes over there, shut another door. And then I said, I'll be, I'm going to get back up to my station before you uh, finish. So before the lion gets back out, I wanted to be ready. And I run up there, and then I'm thinking to myself, did she shut the other door behind her? And that door that I was wondering if she hadn't shut is going to lead the lion right outdoors. Outdoors, outdoors. Outdoors, outdoors. Not into the... Not into the exhibit. Oh, my goodness. So I hand my gun again, my dart gun, over to my partner. I run across that rock work, run across the roof, climb down the ladder, look in. There he is in an open door, and that door is, in fact, left open. Now, I had to walk almost as close as you and me by a lion that's almost looking me in the eye and you never turn your back on them. That's one thing about predators. You always lock eyes with them wow. because they want to attack from behind. So I got by him. I slammed a slide door right in his face and then I think I almost had a heart attack. But I had to get from here across the room and get to where that door was worked. And uh, it was one of the scarier moments oh, I've wow. had. I've had other adventures, you know, that gorilla that escaped many years ago. Wow, we so that's had, another thing. I had well, to bring I'd like to come back. back to that, but um, you also have a video that you wanted to show, yeah. right? Yeah, I have several, and, so. Okay, so um, Roy, I w I'm wondering, uh, could I queue up a video? And uh, good, here we go. And I don't think we need to narrow. My name is Christina, and I'm a senior zookeeper here at the Tropical Forest at the Franklin Park Zoo. Environmental enrichment is a technique that we use here at the zoo to stimulate the animals both mentally and physically and to encourage their natural behaviors. We use feeder toys like puzzle feeders. We'll take balls and drill holes in them and fill them with food so the animals have to actually manipulate the toys to get the food out. Today we gave our ringtail lemurs some brows. They do enjoy the mulberry brows, especially this time of year. It's starting to get berries on it. It's a nice tasty treat for them. One of the forms of enrichment that we offer the gorillas is the forage feed. We cut up their diet into small pieces and we scatter it around the exhibit. In the wild, they would spend a lot of time trying to find different vegetation, finding food, building homes, finding mates. We essentially provide all of that and encourage them to learn and to play and explore their surroundings just as they would in the wild. All right, so um, again, my name's Steve Kelly. I'm the host at Community Forum, and I'm back here with John Linehan. We're enjoying this wonderful show about the zoos here in New England. We've got the uh, Franklin uh, Park Zoo and also the Stone Zoo, and the president and CEO, John, is with us, and, and he's also brought Benny here on the bench. Yeah. So um, that was a nice presentation. Um, t I, I see you have a lot of helpers there. Tell, tell me a little bit about um, both your staff and um, perhaps an intern uh, opportunity sure. or something. Well, what, you, what you're seeing in that video is something we call the, the provision of an environmental enrichment. So for these animals every day, we have staff that are uh, not only cleaning up after them, feeding them, uh, but they're also creating new things every day to keep the animals stimulated. You know, in a captive environment, you don't have as much stimulation as in the wild. So we try to create things, uh, challenges for the animals. So some of those, you saw some feeder yeah. toys. They actually have to w figure out how to get to the food or it's things that make uh, 
feeding times stretch out longer. It challenges the animal in another way. So they're, they're always working on uh, new means to stimulate the animals. And that's a big part of what they do. And that's part of what we have a fantastic internship program at the zoo. It's usually uh, kids that are in college between their junior and senior years. And uh, the summertime gets packed. If anybody's interested in trying to get into the internship program in the winter, I mean in the summer, they have to apply it by January okay. because it gets so filled up. Uh, but it's a great program. We've actually had kids from all over the world come through that program. I really believe it's, it's the best internship program out there in a zoo because not only do they get the hands-on training and experience with the zoo, working with our, our zookeepers, but they're doing an independent project. But weekly, we have classes for them to take that teach them the insights of how zoos work and uh, everything from how these... Uh, very elaborate breeding programs are, are organized and pulled off. Uh, what are the principles behind it? To animal handling and restraint. So, you know, we have to teach them everything from uh, all the different equipment we use to handle animals, everything from uh, blow darts to lassoes to, um, it, the list is pretty extensive. And then uh, many, many other uh, technical components of uh, zookeeping and uh, captive animal management. So it's a fantastic program. Uh, my staff, my keepers are all, you know, for the most part, they, they all graduated. Some have graduate degrees in zoology or biology or animal behavior. Uh, many of them have come through uh, either our internship program or some, some other zoos. And, uh, you know, it, being a zookeeper is, is a uh, very rewarding hard work physically challenging quite often, but uh, rewarding in the sense that you're, you, you like what you're doing, not necessarily you have enough money to do everything you want to do. <laughs> so yep. uh, we're, we're always trying to make that better, but uh, unfortunately uh, we can't afford as much as we would like. But great people, absolutely fantastic people that uh, you know anybody but would be thrilled to work with, people that want to make a positive difference, that are so dedicated to uh, not only their animals, we have many who are so good at educating young people. We have our whole, our whole education team as well, but um, the zookeepers do a great job of, of really uh, drawing young people in, in particular, into the animals and getting them to really start uh, opening their heart and opening their mind and stimulating uh, really intellectual discussions after they've got them hooked emotionally. So if I were to be talking to a young person who said, I really like animals, yeah. then I would say to them, it sounds like I would say to them, uh, you probably should go to the zoo and try to get a job cleaning cages in December when everybody else, when they need some help. Well, and then see who can pull you in as a mentor kind of mentee relationship. Yeah, there are volunteer opportunities available. So yeah. uh, people can get experience that way. But believe it or not, uh, there's a limit to how many volunteers we can even take. Wow. So, and sometimes there's a backlog and, and people are sitting on waiting lists. Um, with, there are not only what we call keeper aid volunteer positions, but docents, people who are trained to educate people when they come to the zoo. There, there's a help with events. There's a whole bunch of different uh, volunteer opportunities at the zoo. But um, the, the zookeeper, uh, sort of line is something that if somebody's interested in, I really recommend they volunteer and test it. You know, before okay. you go to college for all this stuff, before yeah. you uh, sign up for a 400-hour internship, which is what it requires, right, right. Um, get a taste of it. Make sure that that's something you, you know, for me, I used to just pinch myself every day that I was getting to do what I was getting to do. And, wow. and uh, so, you know, I've worked with an incredible array of animals. I've been... Uh, Everything from a, I rescued an elephant once, left on the side of the road, to uh, oh my goodness, working with you know invertebrates that are they can be actually absolutely fascinating, and we we have um, some great so, achievements. So let's not assume that I would know what an invertebrate is. What's an invertebrate? Uh, well, putting it simply, bugs, but you know insects and spiders and uh, animals without backbones. Okay. So. Uh, most of them have what's called an exoskeleton, so they're hard on the outside. They don't need a, 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 a skeletal structure. Um, and they shed that skin, that, that uh, external as they grow. 
Uh, but, you know, fascinating. You know, some of those spiders and tarantulas and, and uh, scorpions and, and all those critters are really fascinating. And, and uh, we have different people in the zoo that sort of focus on different animals. Their, their heart is in different areas. Pri we have primate people and big cat people and, and domestic, you know, dom horses and, and cows and goats. Uh, I've always been, I've always liked them all. I love, you know, I, everybody always says, what's your favorite animal at the zoo? And, yeah, and what is your favorite? <laughs> no offense, Benny. <laughs> yeah, Benny, block those ears. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love snakes, actually, but I have two favorites, and, I, and I've been thinking about this. I, I have, uh, <laughs> you have to think Little Joe, your favorites. Okay. which is that gorilla that escaped. Yeah. He is one of my favorites. And then we have uh, Bo, our big male Maasai giraffe that uh, we, we were able to bring through an illness that no giraffe had ever survived before. And uh, it's called giraffe wasting syndrome. And we thought oh. it was a death sentence for him. But we changed everything about the way we take care of him. We contacted every expert in the world that was studying this sickness. And um, my vets put together a treatment plan based on that. And in fact, most of them disagreed with each other. They all had their own theories. Wow. So she just had to take what she could glean from each of them and uh, put together a treatment plan, and that was now 11 years ago. And my friend Bo has had four offspring. I think he's got a fifth on the way. Wow. And uh, he's just, he's a 2,800-pound puppy dog in some 2, ways. 2,800 pounds? Yeah, so he's, he's a great guy, and he's got tons of personality. But uh, unfortunately, you know, when he had this illness, he had lost 700 pounds. He was so weak, he was shaking. And uh, it's a long story about how we saved Bo, but uh, we had many people, many people who cut brows for us, cut branches off of tr appropriate trees, and, and Bo liked eating that. Uh, got a lot of kids involved. There was a young lady in New Hampshire that raised over $10,000 to help us buy specialized foods for him. Well, he's finally deciding he wants to get going somewhere. <laughs> well, I think he's upset that Bo and uh, the yeah, gorilla, he heard me. Uh, got got a little bit more play here. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, Benny, I like you too. Well, that's very, very nice. <laughs> so I've uh, I've had uh, lots of adventures, but Bo, Bo and Little Joe are kind of my buddies. Isn't and that terrific, boy? Now, uh, just because I know it's part of every business, every the the life of every business person as the CEO. Um, tell us a little bit about funding, uh, how difficult that is. Sure. Uh, you know, what are the trade-offs that you're making as you try to um, make sustainability a quest for that, your That's uh, job? a really good question. You know, as the CEO, that, those are the things I worry about sometimes more than did little Joe have diarrhea the other day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunately, and, and so uh, making ends meet, zoos are expensive places to run. And making ends meet is often difficult, and, and uh, so everything from admissions to fundraising I get involved with, as well as the politics of, of getting uh, the Commonwealth to support it. You know, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts actually owns the Franklin Park Zoo and the Stone Zoo, and created this nonprofit to manage them for them, and, and said, you know, we will provide uh, support to some extent, which means I have to get on there and make the case for support every year at this time right. of year, budget time. Um, so they, we've been level funded by the state for four years now. Uh, it's a little lower than it should be, and it, it's caught up with us a bit. We've been increasing our admission rates, which I, as a guy with four kids, I understand what that means. But we do create opportunities for people for whom uh, admission is a hardship to get in. Right. Um, and there's many opportunities. You know, Stoughton Library has uh, passes that people can get, and then I think it costs you five dollars or four dollars to get in. What What is the normal? Ad the normal admission? admission rate right now is seventeen ninety five for adults, fourteen ninety five for kids, and that's at Franklin Park. Right now, because we're doing a lot of construction at Stone Zoo, we've cut it back to eight ninety five, seven ninety five, and six ninety five. Seven ninety five for seniors. So anybody at both places, we have a, a little discount for seniors as well. So, and, and then you said something about, um, but at, at the library they have some things at, they can do? Uh, yeah, it, many libraries uh, subscribe and buy our, our passes, 
and then they get a, a tear-off pass that they can give to a family. I think it's good for four people to get in for like five bucks a piece or something. So it's, it's a nice program and the libraries uh, get a lot of use out of it. Right. Um, we also have another video that um, you had brought on. Right. And, and that's for children, I understand? Kids? Yes. Yes. So this is going to be... Kids talking about the zoo. Kids talking about the zoo. These are the people going to take your job someday. Is that right? Yeah, I hope so. You hope so? <laughs> <laughs> so I've, got a, I've got a lot of uh, really great kids that yeah. I'm hoping are going to kick me out someday. All right. Well, we're going to ask Roy if Roy could queue up a, uh, the, the video with the uh, kids. I like to um, look at animals because they're just interesting. Different movements, like the gorillas. I like seeing peacocks, look at the birds, the reptiles, maybe some of the bugs. I like the lion. My favorite animal is cats, and the lion is a cat. My favorite animal is the sloth. I like the sloth because they're cute. At the zoo, my favorite animal is probably the zebras. They just run free and nobody's telling them what to do. And they just all stick together. When I was a kid, I used to come here to the zoo with my grandmother. And I just loved the zoo because I loved animals. I loved their great outdoors. My favorite part about visiting the zoo is feeling what like some of the habitats they live in are, like what they look like and what they do. I really like to see the animals because I could learn where they're, they're from and like that animal over there. It's from Brazil. I've learned most of the stuff I know about animals here. There's not only animals, there's the habitats and how they live and that's allowed me to learn more about other places that I will probably never travel to. I've learned like layers of the rainforest and what like the animals can do. I learned a lot of things like where they live, what they need to survive, how they can help us. It's important for people to care about animals because it is important for people to know about the natural world and to be able to know that they're not the only beings on Earth. People should care about animals because they're really important. It's important to take care of your pet. I think people should visit the zoo because it's, well, not because it's just interesting, because it's fun. I think other people should visit the zoo because you get to learn about animals and see how they live and where they live. They're living things, just like we are, we're living things. So we should care about living things. If people didn't care about animals, they wouldn't be well and they wouldn't be here. All right, I'm back with John Linehan. And after seeing the kids, uh, John, um, tell me a little bit, it's almost as if you can affect the spirit and the soul of children with, with animals. I think that's really a, a great way to put it. You know, what these animals do is, is uh, help us teach compassion. And, wow. and these guys, so many of these young people, their perspective on life has changed. Uh, after working, with, working in the zoo or, or being associated with our education programs, the most incredible young people I've ever met have gone through our programs and, and some of them I, I say they're like little professors of zoology but they're so <laughs> emotionally committed to conservation and to you know making the world a good place and for animals and people that it's it it it's a really drives you to work harder even you know they they we just started something because of all the stuff that we were seeing we started a youth uh, council that's acting as an advisory body to the zoo and you know something that so we're not sitting there guessing you know this is how kids are communicating today or this is the message we need to get out these young people can get involved in helping to uh, design exhibits and how to communicate with other people and what kids are really looking for and they're uh, it's it, it, the kid part of this whole job is not something I get into it for and it's just amazing what it does to you though Wow I, I love what you said that it if there's a way to teach compassion, it's certainly something the world needs. Yeah. And, and um, if this is that pathway, then um, we need to make sure that the state funds this and <laughs> funds it better. So um, let me switch gears a little. Uh, you brought another friend. I did. So um, let's let's. I'm um, a little out of sync here, but 
uh, this is uh, a friend that actually people can find if they get lucky and see right here in, in Stoughton the um, a little lock on the, yeah. on the um on the cage, so we'll work on that. <laughs> I, I haven't actually used this one before. We'll, we'll ask the animal. There we <laughs> Can go. that work? <laughs> Are you under there? No. Yeah, it seemed like that was a, a good place for something to come out. Well, let's come back to it. I'll, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. There we go. Um, oh, it, we, we did find it. All right. So John is going to bring us out a... Um, a bird of a different feather. A bird of a different feather. And that's going to be an owl. This is an eastern screech owl. An eastern screech owl. And it's something that lives right here in Stoughton. Lives here in the entire area. Yeah, they're very, it's a very common owl. And it's an owl that's um, a little camera shy, but has beautiful colors. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful animal. So this guy, his name is Widget. Widget. Widget wow. actually ended up uh, coming down when somebody cut down an old tree in their yard. Oh, and Widget and one ended thing up falling people down. People should appreciate, old trees make huge uh, uh, difference for wildlife in terms of their homes. You know, those hollow trees that are out there really have a an important function in terms of animal homes. And wow. so Widget was injured when that tree came down. He was a little guy, he was a young guy, and had to be hand raised, but he has some, uh, when the tree came down, it damaged some of his toes. So he obviously with, with owls, uh, having good talons is key to survival. And you'd be surprised how many different things, you know, everybody always thinks they eat, uh, they eat mice, obviously yeah. they do. But oh, outs there, outside of mice, they, they also oh. eat insects, they eat frogs, they, eat, they actually eat other songbirds. So they're amazing little guys, they have great calls, and we just came through their breeding season. Uh, this guy's only three years old, and so he's got a lot of years ahead of him. Well, what would be the typical life for an owl? Uh, maybe 15 for a screech owl. Wow, so uh, he's three. 15, even 20. Wow. So he's, uh, this is what you call a red phase screech owl. So they come in two color phases, a sort of mottled brown gray that blends in actually a little bit better, and then this red phase. And uh, you know, the red phase makes him look very handsome. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what the ad adaptation is between the red and the gray, but it seems like the grays would actually blend in better. We have uh, actually a number of owl species around Stoughton. They're very secretive. You know, they have special adaptations for silent flight. Uh, they actually have three-dimensional feathers that silence the, the noise of their flying by, which is really important because uh, owls, you know, you see those big, huge eyes, but also look at those ear tufts. They do a lot of hunting by sound. They can hunt in complete darkness, and just by sound, those ears are actually offset. It's an engineering issue offset from, from each other so that they can triangulate at a target by sound alone. And they have in their neck, you know, you just saw how far he can turn his head around. Yeah, um, he, he was able to, it's on a swivel. They, they, have, they have a huge number of vertebrae in there which allows them to turn it, you know, fully uh, 270 degrees, I think it is. So oh. uh, their eyes are so large because they gather in so much light but the, the flip side of it is that they can't turn them in their sockets. They're too big to turn. That's why their head is so mobile. And they, uh, you know, they, you can see his talons in there. He obviously isn't going to take huge animals, but uh, they're pretty tough. And they also have to watch out for hawks. Hawks will prey on them during the day, and, and owls will prey on hawks at night. Oh, so, it's, so it, larger owls. Yeah. Right? Yeah, um, I saw an owl at Borderland, and yeah. my goodness, the Did wingspan you? was um, I must have been four feet. Yeah, so you must have seen either a, uh, a great horned owl. I don't know if you could see it well enough, or a barred owl, probably. One I'd have to see a picture to know, but I was amazed, and it was quite scary that the, the, the I didn't realize. I don't know how I thought they got up in trees. Yeah, 
but it surprised me that he flew up there. Yeah. And when he, he flew by me, I was actually riding a bike. Yeah. He flew over my head Just and, and his wingspan be, yeah. was amazing. And then up into the tree he it's went. It's really great. And cool, closed himself in and, and you got looked like an owl again. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they uh, great horned owls are referred to as the tigers of the sky. They are pretty voracious predators and uh, even the hawks have to watch out for them. So what kind of caging, if you would, would do you need, when you, when you have that animal at the zoo, Widget, uh, is there like a fly area the size of this room, let's say a 16 no, foot height? No, no, because most of the animals we have in the, that are program animals like this are injured. Okay. So uh, many of the birds don't fly. So we usually keep them in smallish cages where they aren't gonna try to fly and get hurt and then they go out and do programs, and, and that's their primary uh, means of uh, getting exercise. We'll, what we do is when we're training an animal that's going to go back to be free, free flight, we, act, we have bigger rooms than this even, and we have to do flight training because they actually have to build up their endurance again. I've done that with a lot of bats. We have uh, the most incredible bats, uh, these giant African fruit bats with a three-foot wingspan, and we have to do flight training for them to get them back in shape and then we release them into the huge tropical forest we have. And uh, so when we have evening events in there, you see big, huge fruit bats fly by. Wow. Uh, and don't ever harass them because they know how to direct their uh, excrement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, what I'd like to do is I wanted to make sure we got time to do the video free training that you have. Yes, and that's fascinating. So um, I'm wondering, uh, I'm going to put Roy, Widget uh, back in. I wanted to be able to show the audience the training video. So we're going to let Widget have a rest. And here we are with the uh, training video. I'm a senior keeper here at Bird's World and uh, train our peacocks. Good. The training program allows us to call the animals to us instead of us trying to chase after them. It helps us when we need to get a closer inspection of our animals. If there's a potential injury that we need to take a look at, our vets would be able to come by and we'd be able to start the training session. A lot of positive reinforcement needs to go into a training program in order for anything to happen. Good boy. Oh, good job. Good scale. One of our peacocks was a little bit more nervous around people and it took a lot longer. They are really smart. It's just a matter of how much trust there is between the peacocks and the zookeepers here. I'm a senior zookeeper at the Tropical Forest in Franklin Park Zoo. And we train all of our gorillas once or twice a day. And all the training we do has a purpose. Good boy. Very nice. You get a really strong relationship with the animal. You get to learn what they're good at, what they're not good at, really problem solve and figure out what they want. You want to keep it fun and positive because if they get bored, they're going to walk away. It's always a challenge for me to keep them as interested in me and what I have for them to keep training. We go open, hold it. When I have a behavior that is difficult to get, it's really such a high, you're like, I did that, they did that, and they had fun doing that, and it's going to help them live longer and be healthier, which is the point of our training program and the point of having animals here at the zoo. Pay attention. All right, we're back with John. And John, you wanted to add one, one quick thing here? Yeah, well, I, just the, the, the training that, that you just got to see a little bit of um, is really a a fascinating newer development in the zoos. So when I was a zookeeper, um, we weren't, we didn't even have a name for it. We did a little bit of training, but the, the keepers of today uh, just achieve amazing things with, with this training and, and ways to help keep our animals healthy. So it's, it's uh, a newer development. One of the beauties of it is obviously all of us who like animals like to interact with them. And this gives our keepers a great opportunity to interact in a positive way with our animals. Um, we also have, have done some things recently where we're promoting positive interaction between visitors and animals. And I think that one of the, uh, one of the really fun things to do is to go into our, our Aussie aviary. It's an Australian aviary with uh, parakeets with budgies in it and people can get a seed stick and the birds will actually fly down and land on you and then fly off and uh, pull the seeds off the stick and, and wow. uh, the kids, it, I always call it a smile factory <laughs> because the kids absolutely That's love great. it. And uh, all these beautiful brightly colored budgies, we have a giraffe feeding opportunity. We've, we've got actually got a, a, a 4D video uh, experience. It's like a Disney thing where you get strapped into a seat and you go out and 
help save or ha save rhinos from poachers. So wow. uh, that's our rhino rescue ride. So we got to get everything going. Um, I wanted to read the credits, so no, let sure. me get that, and then we'll jump back with a couple of final thoughts. Great. So uh, Roy, if you can run the credits for us. So the zoo, the New England Franklin Park Zoo, and the Stone Zoo. Uh, I think the office address is 1 Franklin Park Road, is that right? right? In Boston. And 617, I love this, I love this phone number. 617-541-LION. <laughs> All right, www.thezoonewengland.org. And uh, now we've got a few announcements. Comedy Meets Rock and Roll presents comedian Steve Sweeney. The music by Rocksteady. And my, Michelle Romero, Joe Kidd. Also, Saturday, June 21st, 2014, 7 to 10 p.m. at the Stoughton High School Auditorium. So come on out and see this wonderful show. General admission is $20 per person to benefit the special ed department. Um, for advanced tickets, call ACE Ticket at 800-697-3287. For show info and local ticket sales, 774-259-9809. We Are United Group will have concessions there. So you can help them just by buying a drink or so. And give pints for half pints, as it would. Sherm's sixth annual blood drive for Children's Hospital. I did this, I think, last year. It was great, in memory of Fran Stetson, hosted by Sherm's Auto Body in Stoughton. Do come out and uh, pass around some good blood. Sunday, June 1st, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Breakfast and lunch will be served. I think it's all you can eat. They had bacon and sausage. <laughs> they had so much stuff there, it was unbelievable. And that's at the Sociedad Philharmonica de Sao Joao Club. I don't know how much I did with the Portuguese there, but hopefully it was good. 845 Washington Street, Route 138 Stoughton. It's a great cause. And Uncorked is a unique wine tasting event right here that John is gonna host. Pop a cork with a gorilla at the Franklin Park Zoo, Saturday, May 31st, 5 to 7.30 p.m. Do not get the gorillas drunk. Tickets are $45 per person. They're available at www.zoonewengland.org. What a fun thing to do on a Saturday. And the crew would like to thank mm -mm -mm <laughs> Maxie's <laughs> Delicatessen at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. 7813411662. And American Cancer Society is looking for volunteers to drive cancer patients to and from treatments. 1 800 ACS 6662 www.cancer.org. We also have Ilsa Mox Food Pantry in St. Anthony's Free Market at 2 Park Avenue in Stoughton. For more information, call the lovely Christine Gallagher, 781 3410611 or 781 3410549. And Meals on Wheels, ask for Jessica, 781-344-8882, extension two. And the Stoughton Penny Saver, we'd like to thank them as well for supporting us. And their slogan is, our business is advertising your business. 27 Rose Glen Street, Stoughton, 781-344-4833. And the International Forum Show, hosted right here at SMAC, interviews guests with local roots throughout the world via Skype. Um, Sundays at 8.30 p.m., Mondays at 11 p.m., Wednesdays at 9 a.m., Thursdays at 9.30. So jot down some of these times, Saturday at 12 noon. And that's Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 28, international.forum at yahoo.com. 781-760-6991 to get on the show, to ask questions about the show, or to bring someone you know onto the show. Stoughton Farmer's Market, that's a wonderful thing that Stoughton is doing, trying to create community. And this year, it's gonna be at the First Parish Universalist Church, 790 Washington Street, Stoughton Center, right at smack in the square. You'll see it every Saturday, starting June 14th, I think it is, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, rain or shine, we have, we're showing June 7th here, but it might be the 14th, you'll have to check. It's a nonprofit. it's volunteer run. We have two farms, a couple of bakeries, and we have live music as well. So I've done some editing on that slide, but I'm sure that um, I'm closer to being right than the slide is. Uh, <laughs> community Forum, our show times in Stoughton, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6 p.m. you'll see our show. Mondays at 8 p.m., Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 28, 
We'd love to hear from you. Communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Tell us how we're doing. Tell us what you think we should be showing. I'm sure you want to approve of John Linehan's show here with the Stone and the Franklin Park Zoo. So let's hear about that. Community Forum showtimes in Easton, Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 8 a.m., Wednesday 3 p.m., Saturday at 10 a.m. That's Comcast Channel 9, but Verizon Channel 22. Same contact information. It's an email, communityforum1 at yahoo.com. All right, so I'm back with John. John, what's the final takeaways? You've got a couple of minutes to share with the well, audience. I would say the big thing is, this is perfect zoo weather. Get to the <laughs> zoo right now. Uh, you know, better yet, buy a membership and come year round because it's a different place every time you go to the zoo. When you've got living creatures, every day is a new day. It's a, it's a, uh, a, a seething hotbed of stories because you, <laughs> you never know what you're gonna see on any given day. Um, we've got some great events, uh, great education programs. Anybody can participate and uh, we, we wanna get people involved and, and uh, learn a lot contribute a lot, make a difference. What's a family membership cost? A family membership right now is $110, I think. Uh, but it's good for a full year. You can get the kids in for free year round. Uh, we have some members that come multiple times a week, in fact. Uh, after school, on weekends, uh, participate in all these programs. We have some that come once a week and some that come once a month. Uh, but it, I think after two visits, you've already paid for it and you're, and you're uh, just getting all the benefits and you get special invitations to events and uh, openings and things like that and uh, discounts on, on everything from the gift shop to the food, uh, on-site food distributions to uh, actually get half price at zoos across the country. We collaborate with each other and, and give each other's members half price admission. Wonderful. Now, I'm a grandfather. Yes. So I'm going to buy Grandparents a, can actually... Okay, so if I buy a family... Um, membership, and I want to bring my grandchildren. Do they, are they included, or I have they, to buy like a it, plus plus package? No, we have those plus plus. If you wanted to bring your your kids and your grandkids, and we, we have sort of multiple ways. Some people uh, actually have a membership where they can always bring an, another person on top of family. So they do ask for your ID. You know, make sure that people aren't passing the memberships around between different people. But yeah, they're very accommodating the staff to grandparents with their grandkids and, and uh, uh, sort of never trying to uh, keep people from getting into the zoo. That's a big thing. Wonderful. Well, thank you for your time on the it's show. My pleasure. I appreciate it's been a great you bringing time. your wonderful friends, Benny and Widget. Widget, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it was just an absolutely fabulous show for people to get to see the valuable work that you do trying to help animals, and I love the theme about creating compassion in people. It, it so really thanks works. for coming by. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. All right.